Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And then when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So for many of us, this passage is so familiar. Maybe you're hearing this and going, oh, I know this one. <laughs> that it's so familiar that your expectations are really low. You're thinking, okay, you know, we've heard this a hundred times before. We heard it growing up in Sunday school. We've heard it ad infinitum. And you, you might even say, you know, I already know this as a complaint, kind of a mild complaint, like, oh, couldn't John do something more in-depth, something more original, some passage that's a bit more obscure that we wouldn't hear anywhere else but at Servants Church. And yet we go to this really familiar passage, and it's interesting because just like this passage, for many of us, church is super familiar. And our expectations are low. We think we know exactly what church is. Church is three or four songs, some decent coffee, or great coffee, as <laughs> mine was today. It's, it's a sermon, 45 minutes-ish. It's, it's, you know, maybe on that fourth Sunday, we, we could just bring in share. That's about all it is. Church is just the things that we do Every week, after every week, after every week, and our expectations are exceedingly low. But I really do believe that Jesus wants us to have expectations that line up with what his work and his word say. That our expectations of our gathering should be similar to what he was doing 2,000 years ago. Because guess what? As we're seeing in the book of Acts, Jesus continues to do his work Amen. among his people by his Holy Spirit. For his glory. And so what we're going to look at today is, is we want to talk about, we want to, we want to help, I want to help you guys realize five things that we should expect when Jesus gathers us together. Some of these things might be really obvious, other things might not be so obvious, but I really hope as you, as we go through this, that you see that this is one of the things that Jesus is trying to get across to us. That Mark is laying out the story. In fact, it's one of those stories that is in all four of the Gospels, not just Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, but all four of the Gospels highlight this story, and it's highlighted there so that we would get a sense of what Jesus does when he gathers people together. So let's look at the first one in verses 30 to 32. We should expect his call to receive rest. Now, in verse 30, these 12 are identified as the apostles, most, mostly throughout um, the book of, of Mark, they're identified as apostles, I mean, or as disciples. But here, apostles, because earlier in chapter 6, Jesus had told these 12, he had sent them out to preach the gospel and heal. Preach the kingdom of God and heal. And they had gone out and, and done that. So when Mark tells us the apostles, he's talking about these specific 12, that they've come back. And they've had some success. They want to celebrate. They want to share with Jesus this fruitful ministry that has happened. And it's interesting because God had moved through them in these radical ways. And the, 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 they really were excited about it. But the truth was the ministry hadn't slowed down. 
It says very clearly, right, that they couldn't even, so many people were coming and going, they didn't have time to stop and eat. They were that busy. And so Jesus wisely says to them, I want you to come and I want you to rest a while. But that's not the only circumstance. The other circumstance we see, and we see this right before this section in verses 14 to 29, is that the disciples and Jesus have just found out that John the Baptist has been executed. And we don't want to forget it, that John the Baptist was, was a man who was radically instrumental in bringing these 12 disciples to Jesus. Most of them, if not all of them, became Jesus followers because John said, I must decrease, he must increase. Because John pointed past himself and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so they came to know Jesus as Messiah in, in, in part by the ministry of John the Baptist. Not to mention Jesus was a relative to John the Baptist. And as a relative to John the Baptist, his heart was grieving that John was executed. And, and they also were grieving over the fact, probably the fact that they recognized that John's last days before his execution were tough. As he's, he's languishing in this prison, as he's unjustly in prison, and then he's unjustly executed in, in a really shameful way as well. As that happens, they're probably grieving over this. And so you have this, this dynamic of they've just had this really fruitful ministry, but they also have this real grief going on. And Jesus says, come and rest a while. And the reason this is important for us to, to recognize is because as Jesus followers, we should expect our lives to be shaped by both these things, fruitful ministry and real grief. It's not as if, if, if Jesus has said, come, walk with me, trust me, and life will go good with you. The gospel, quote unquote, that's preached that says, if you just have enough faith, you won't suffer, is a false gospel. Yep. It's not what the scripture teaches. The whole book of Job in the Old Testament is clear about how that we suffer and we, we go through things that are from the outside. The enemy comes against us. But God's still in control and he has his way. The whole book of 1 Peter, the first letter from Peter, is all about how suffering comes in our midst amongst us. But God still has his way. But it doesn't mean, listen, that when that suffering comes that we shouldn't grieve about it that we don't need to grieve about it. See, we, we, we should expect our lives to be shaped by the good that God does in and through us. And we should expect God to do good things. We should be praying in that direction. God, do good stuff in me. Change me. Make me like Jesus. And help me to share Jesus with other people. Do that good work through me. We should be praying in that direction and seeing God do stuff. God does good stuff through us. He wants to make himself known through us and to us. But also we should expect that there's going to be bad that grieves us and that God actually wants us to lament through. We'll talk about what lament is in just a minute. And so this is why Jesus calls these men aside to rest. And notice what he calls them to do. Look at verse 31 again. In verse 31 he says, he says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place. And then we see in verse 32, that's what they did. They went into the boat and they go to a desolate place by themselves. The idea is not by themselves without Jesus, but by themselves with Jesus. There's the 13 on retreat. It's, it's to a quiet place with Jesus. Jesus is wanting to provide space for them to both process their joys and their sorrows. And notice, Jesus is with them in that processing. He's with them there. This is definitely the benefit that we experience when we have that daily quiet time, when we sneak away in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening, whenever we can sneak away, whether it be for an hour or five minutes, whatever we can grab, and we say, Lord, it's just, I want to be with you. I, I, I need to have a little bit of time to process what my, where my life's at. I just want to be in your presence going through this. There's definitely a benefit. But this is the thing we need to recognize. He didn't call each of them. He didn't say, you know what? Why don't each of you go away and have a quiet time? He calls them away together. The call to rest was a, was a corporate call. Come and rest together. In other words, come be with me and process those joys. And like, wow, God's doing good stuff through us. Process that. Give me thanks for that. Glorify me in that. But also, let's deal with the, the real grief. 
Let's talk about how hard it is that John the Baptist suffered the way he did and that he's gone. Let's grieve over that together. See, this is what the Lord calls us to. Talking about lament, here's what lament is. Lament is a prayer of sorrow or pain or confusion. It's us processing our grief in God's presence. This doesn't necessarily mean you and Jesus by yourselves. It can be that, but it's not limited to that. It should be what we are able to do with one another when we gather, we lament with one another. Remember Paul's practical exhortation in Romans chapter 12? Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice, rejoice and weep with those who weep. He says, live in harmony with one another. It doesn't mean just get along. It means, hey, walk in step with each other. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. In other words, don't go, well, I'm above that. I, I'm not suffering. God's blessing me. I don't want to deal with the suffering people. No, no, no. Bring yourself to them. And never be wise in your own eyes when you are because don't assume you know exactly how to grieve with someone else. Sometimes just being present and quiet is the best thing we can do. The point is this. We should be rejoicing with each other. We should be the kind of people that when God's doing good things, we can say, we can share. When someone says, how's it going? You can share. You know what? God does this really cool thing today or this week. I really feel like God met me at this place or I felt like God used me in a conversation or I felt like God kind of gave me a, some clarity on something. And then we share that and we stop and we say, Jesus, you're here. And so we want to say thank you for doing this in my brother's heart or my sister's life. Do you see what I'm saying? But it also should be a time when we get together and someone can say, hey, how's your week been? And we say, it's been absolute rubbish. I just turned 55 and I got a dodgy shoulder and I got sciatica. And it annoys me. I want to be young forever. It's hard. And we can be honest. We can say, let's go to Jesus with that. Let's talk to him about that. Do you see the point? The, the point is this. It's not about, listen, it's not about finding rest from time with Jesus or rest from ministry or rest from grief. It's finding rest in it. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says, then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That's join, be joined together with me. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Why? Because when we're knit to him, he does the pulling. See, the reality is, listen, we don't just come to Jesus in that daily quiet time, and this is not me doing anything but encouraging you to have a daily quiet time. It's so, such a great discipline to get into. Again, I know it's tough when your lives are busy, especially when you have small kids at home, they're just always demanding, it's really tough. But if you can just get five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and just say, Lord, I want this to be me and you, God will bless it. But I'm saying, listen, you don't just need that to find rest to answer the call to rest. You get it, or you should be getting it when we come together. You following me? So we should expect in our gatherings a call to receive rest, and we should answer that call. But also look at verse 33. We should expect his compassion for the crowd. In verse 33 it says, Now many uh, saw that he was coming and, and going, and they recognized them, and they ran on foot, all to towns to get there ahead of them. I mean, isn't that amazing? They wanted Jesus' ministry so bad, they ran to where he was going. I see how you guys walk in the church. There's not a whole lot of enthusiasm sometimes. Or you come in and it's like quarter until 11. I see it. Come on, we all see it. But these people who did not yet know Jesus as he was, they weren't disciples yet, they ran. Something about his ministry is so attractive. But here's what happens, right? They, they run to Jesus, right? They run to feet where Jesus and his disciples are. And it says in verse 34, and when they went ashore, he saw, Jesus saw the great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. Sheep without a shepherd. This is why he had compassion. What does it mean to be a sheep? Well, first of all, please know it's not flattering at all. <laughs> To be a sheep is to be vulnerable. 
You're vulnerable by nature. Sheep can't defend themselves against predators. And also, they'll eat anything. They don't discern what's toxic and what's healthy. By nature, they're vulnerable. By choice, they're vulnerable. Sheep often wander away from the flock. The one thing that kind of gives them a measure of protection, they often wander away from the flock, making them easier targets for predators. And sheep are vulnerable by situation. One of the reasons why you see this metaphor of sheep being used about God's people and shepherds being used about God's leaders is because often you see shepherds as bad shepherds. Where, where they're just, they don't look after God's people and those sheep are vulnerable because they don't have someone looking after them. And this is what Jesus is, is grieving over. He's grieving over the fact that these are vulnerable people and nobody's shepherding them. These are, as it says in Isaiah 53, all like sheep having gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We are like sheep. The crowd, those who gather around us, or those who are in our midst who don't yet know Jesus are sheep without a shepherd. They're even more vulnerable than we are. And Jesus has compassion on them. And so what does he do? He shepherds them. Look at verse 34 again, the last part of verse 34. He says, he began to teach them many things. Now we know from Luke's version of this account that he was teaching them about the kingdom of God. And we know from Matthew's account that he was also healing people. So he's teaching about the kingdom of God. He's saying, hey, God's kingdom comes with a king. It's me. <laughs> and he's also healing them, showing that the kingdom of God is, is breaking in. The brokenness of this world that's been broken by uh, our, our sin, the, the, the heavenly uh, perfection of God has entered in through Jesus, and that brokenness is beginning to be healed. He, he, he does this. See, Jesus... They're vulnerable, so Jesus feeds them what is healthy. He fixes what is broken, and he calls them to focus on his trustworthiness. That's how he shepherded them. See, this is the point, okay? This is why we gather together, why Jesus gathers us together. It's because he's the good shepherd, and he wants to shepherd through us. We're in this season of transition as a church going from sort of a more A-frame type of ministry, uh, leadership, down to a, a flattened leadership. We're flattening leadership. We're learning to be multiple shepherds, shepherding the flock under the great shepherd, Jesus. But it's not just a flattening of the leadership. We are really wanting to see the church flatten. And what I mean by that is there's a shepherding of one another. It's not a hierarchy. We're not waiting until we have all things sorted before we start shepherding each other. We just walk by faith in that shepherding. Lord Jesus, you're the great shepherd. You want to lead us. You want to work to us. And you want to work through us to shepherd one another. This is why we gather. See that, that verse I just read in Isaiah 53. Listen to the context. Why we can trust Jesus to teach us how to have compassion on sheep and shepherd one another. Listen to this, Isaiah 53. He was this, this is speaking of the suffering servant, which points forward to Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus knows our grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, we are like sheep, and Jesus is the good shepherd, and him being the good shepherd, what did he do? He became a sheep, a lamb, to understand our griefs and our sorrows, to rejoice in our joys, and ultimately to give himself as a sacrifice to pay for our brokenness. Now, the, the, the Israelites always knew, God's people have always known that the Lord was their shepherd. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
And Jesus reveals himself as that shepherd. He says, listen, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Now, this is important because we should expect that God has compassion on the crowd, on those who have yet to come to know Jesus and those who know Jesus who are struggling to follow him. Therefore, what do we do? As Jesus followers, we shepherd one another. We remind one another of, listen, we follow one who understands our grief. We follow one who who was stricken on our behalf. We follow him. Let's do that together knowing he has compassion on us. Hey, you might not feel compassion for the person that's hurting. You might feel like, I got nothing left to give. Then go to him who has the compassion. Go with the person who needs it and just say, God, I don't have what I know you have. You have great compassion. You get my brother or sister's grief. You understand what they're going through and because you have that compassion, because you're the great shepherd, we're gonna come to you and trust you to do what needs to be done in our midst. This is what Jesus is going to try to teach his disciples through this situation. He has compassion for the crowd. And so, having that compassion in the crowd, he teaches them many things. In verse 35 it says, And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolated place, and the hour is now late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. Now, in verses 35 to 37, we see another thing. Another thing that we should expect. We should expect our limitations to be exposed. When we gather together, we should expect our limitations to be exposed. This is, in fact, I think we do expect this. This is why we hide so much. This is why we fake it. We put on the Sunday morning smile. Hello, brother, how are you? No, I'm not going to tell you how I just yelled at my wife in the car. Or I said foul words to my children. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to fake it. But Jesus wants to expose limitations. In fact, here's what's being exposed now. The disciples rightly understood that the crowds needed to eat. They probably thought they were being very compassionate. Now, I'd be willing to bet that they, like us, had mixed motives in this. That they were feeling like, Lord, these people need to eat. We can't feed them. You've got to send them away. But they're also thinking, I thought we were supposed to be on vacation. <laughs> this is supposed to be a holiday. What's going on? You might feel this way sometimes. I thought church was about rest. And it feels like work. I have these responsibilities and they're heavy. Or people are so needy. Or I'm so needy and i got to act like I'm not. It's so much work. So we recognize there's something in that that's true. There's an effort and a difficulty that happens when we're gathered together. That people have needs that we just feel like we can't meet them. But this is where the disciples' understanding is really limited. Because look at verse 36. It says, when they said, send them away that they might buy themselves something to eat? What are they doing? They're assuming, listen, they're assuming, they're wrongly assuming the crowds need to sort themselves out. Does that sound familiar? This is exactly what we do to each other. I have actually used the words with people, you gotta sort yourself out, man. I, I, when, when especially with someone maybe who keeps kind of seeming to fall into the same thing over and over and over again, and you wanna just kind of go, man, I feel for you, man, but you gotta sort yourself out. Instead of saying, let's go to Jesus right now and maybe just pray, Lord, would you convict this brother or sister of their need for moment-to-moment repentance and then if they don't repent, they'll perish. Would you do that for them? Because they don't seem to be getting it and I I can't help them, but you can. Would you bring your hand heavy on them as you have for me so that we would both walk in repentance and not, not be bound by our sin? That's daring, isn't it? That's much better than just going, sort yourself out. Because sort yourself out is a false gospel. Repent and believe is a true gospel. You see the difference? So they had this wrong understanding. And their their, their understanding was limited, and that limitation is being exposed. And Jesus is doing this on purpose. He's doing this for their good and for the good of the sheep, the other sheep they're meant to, to deal with. 
But also look at verse 37. It's not just their understanding that was limited. Look at verse 37. So Jesus answers them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go buy basically, you know, 200 days worth of labor, wages, worth of bread? Should we go ahead and, and just spend like tens of thousands of dollars uh, or pounds trying to make sure there's enough to feed these people? Do you really want us to do that? And there's almost a hint of sarcasm in their voice. Yeah, Lord, as if we have that much in the, in the, in the bucket. We've got no food on us, and we don't have this, uh, what it takes. We, we just don't have it. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Remember, Jesus, when he says, you give them something to eat, he's not just exposing them. He's given a real command. He expects them to follow his directions. He expects them to do exactly what he says. And you know why he expects that? Because in the same chapter... You go back to, to verse 7 and verse 13 of chapter 6. You know what you see? Jesus saying, I want you to go out and I want you to, to, to preach the kingdom. Okay, we can do that. We've got big mouths. We can do that. And I want you to heal the sick. And it says he gave them the power and the authority to do that. They had to believe that when God sent them out on two by two in chapter 6, that, that they would actually be able to pray and people would actually be supernaturally healed as Jesus healed people. They actually had to believe that and do this. And now Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed these 5,000 men plus women and children. are going, oh, that can't happen. How's that supposed to happen? Same way the other stuff is supposed to happen. See, here's the reality, okay? Their faith was limited. See, they were unwilling to believe as they had before. Now, before I get misunderstood, let me be really clear about something. I am not saying if we just believe everything we think God wants us to do is automatically going to happen. Every single one of us knows that doesn't work that way. But I am saying this. Our biggest issue as Jesus followers is not church attendance. It's not quiet times. It's not tithing. It's not even sexual sin. Our biggest issue at Jesus followers is unbelief. We just don't really believe that God has revealed himself in Jesus. We don't believe he's as good as he said he is, that he wants to do what he said he's going to do. It's unbelief. This is why we need to be together. We need our limitations exposed so that God can bring us to where we need to be. Listen to this. I read this, I think, last week. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 where the author says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Do you see that? Brothers, unbelieving heart. We can be guilty of not trusting the Lord, taking his word at face value, leading, you away, leading you to fall away from the living God. This is about us following God, not us following a formula. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Why do we gather together? So that our limitations can be exposed. We can confess them. Man, I'm just struggling to believe the Lord in this right now. And we can say, let's go to the Lord together. Let's go to him together and let's pray. God, give me the faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let's go to him together. This is what our gathering should look like. This is why Jesus is wanting these guys to have this experience. Yes, he has compassion on the crowds. Yes, he's going to meet a practical need. There's no doubt that Jesus is doing this, but he's got something bigger in mind. He's showing us how he works. So we expect compassion for the crowd, but we also expect our limitations to be exposed. Next, we, ex we should expect generosity an organization to be needed. Look at verse 38. So they say, we can't do this. We don't have what it takes. So Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they found out and they said, five and two fish. Now we know from John's gospel where the five and two fish came from. Listen to this. It says, there is a boy here. This is Andrew, Peter's brother talking. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many? In other words, when he says, go see what you have, the only thing that comes forth is a small boy's lunch. That's it. Now, there's all kinds of speculation, like maybe the disciples had some, they're being stingy, or maybe other people in the crowd had stuff and they were being stingy. In fact, there are some, there's some line of thinking between some kind of ancient writers or, or, or sort of what they call higher critics of the Bible that say, actually, the miracle was people realized they were just being selfish, and when Jesus prays, then what happens is everyone goes, well, actually, I have lunch. I'll bring it out and I'll share. Now, that would be a lovely thing if people did that, but that is definitely does not fit the context at all. 
But here's the thing that we, I think we're supposed to see. Listen. No matter who had what, this boy gave what he had, and Jesus uses what we're willing to give. Full stop. God is never short on cash. The Lord does not need your money or your service. He really doesn't. When we say we need volunteers, when we do maybe once a year a report on finances and say, here's where we're at, it's not so we say, we need you to give. We need you to serve. No, we don't, nor does God, but you need it. Because God wants to start with what you have. And whatever God gives is where we say, okay, Lord, what do you want to build with this? Now also notice in verse 39 how Jesus is going to command some really purposeful organization. In verse 39, here's what we read. Then Jesus commanded them to all, notice, commanded. He didn't say, hey, I have an idea. He commanded them to all sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, green grass, that phrase, green grass, it's, it feels a bit redundant. There's just two things there. One it helps us to know what time of year this might be. There's only two times a year when the grass is green around Israel, okay, in the, in the former and latter rains, okay. But it's also this, green grass is what sheep need to eat. And this is a picture of him being that good shepherd. And he sat them down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. So Jesus has them, he gives direct organizational commands. Why? Because the shepherd always leads the green grass. And to make that happen, it's about timing and about organization. And the reason he wants these things to be, <laughs> these things to be organized, put them in groups of hundreds and fifties, because trying to make sure 5,000 men plus women and children actually got fed takes organization. It's not an easy thing. He wants to make sure no one gets overlooked. Organization bores many of you. I happen to like it. I'm kind of geeky that way. I like pie charts. <laughs> I, I, I love making lists. I love making lists. Sometimes something will come up that wasn't on my list and I'll just have to do it immediately, but then I'll write it on my list just so I can cross it off. I love organization. I'm not saying I'm always good at organization, but I do love organization. And I used to feel kind of guilty about that, like, gosh, I'm just kind of quenching the spirit because I love organization so much. But you know what I realized? From scripture, our God is a God of order. And he's a God of order because he wants to make sure needs get met. So when we say, we need this many people to come forth for kids ministry, it's not because, oh, we are desperate, we need you, we're sure on this, we're sure on that. It's because God wants organization and order, and we don't want things to be as chaotic as they are. As, as one brother said recently, but it's a charming chaos. <laughs> it is a charming chaos. But we also want to be as less chaotic as we can be so that no needs get overlooked. We should expect this. We should expect there's times when we go, all I got is five loaves and two fish, but I think the Lord wants me to give this. Or man, I didn't, I don't know if I, can I actually schedule in another week, a month where I'm serving? I I don't know, I got so many other commitments. But we gotta be organized, so I gotta make some sort of commitment so everyone can plan. We should expect that to be normal. The reason I bring this up is because I've had people say in the past, I haven't heard this in a while, thankfully, but I've had people say in the past, just trust the Lord. God's going to work it out. The, 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 the need to be organized or the need to, to ask for, for funds or let people even know where the funds are those, are, those are nonsensical. We don't need that. God just does what he does, and we don't need all that. Yeah, we do. Jesus commanded it. It's a good thing. It's not the ultimate thing. One of the things we definitely found out is we organize and God says, yeah, but I want to do something a little bit different. And he goes beyond what we've organized. Or we've, we've budgeted and God goes, actually, I want you to spend that money on this instead. I mean, God does this stuff to us all the time. It's his church, he can do what he wants. But he calls us to an order. Okay, can I get really pointed at this? And I know this is hard. How much better would it be when we start praying, and we're, you know, we always are on the worship team's case a little bit. We're always kind of like, can you guys please start on time? If you're five minutes late, that's one thing. But 10 minutes, 15 minutes, come and try to start on time. But it's hard for them to start when there's 12 people here. Because you guys can't seem to get here on time. Come on. 
I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm trying to say if we were organized and said, well, we want to be there and we want to sing unto you and we want to encourage each other in that, do you think God's going to bless that? I know it's hard, especially when your kids are small. I know it's hard, but I'm going to brag on my wife because she's not sitting out here right now. When we lived in California, we had five children under 11, and she got all five kids to church by herself by 9.30. Well, sometimes 9.45, but still, she showed up. (laughs) Because I could not help on Sunday morning because my job meant I had to be there at 6.30, and I was there until church was over. I know it's hard. Organization's hard. You're going to feel it. But it's also a way that we can... Show worship. Jesus says we should expect this. We learn this from this story. Lastly, and maybe this is the most important thing, and maybe this is where we're lacking the most at Servants Church, I don't know. But we should expect Jesus to work supernaturally. All the organization in the world doesn't force the Holy Spirit to do anything. We need to expect Jesus to work supernaturally. Look at verse 41. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the fish among them all. Now, you wouldn't see this in the English, but there's, there's in the Greek, in the Greek grammar, and I don't know Greek, but I know how to use people. I know how to read people that know how to use Greek, okay? So I don't know Greek. But the point is, it's in a tense that says they, he continued to do something. And the emphasis that Mark's making is the miracle was happening out of Jesus' hand. Okay? So it's as Jesus is giving to the disciples, that multiplication miracle is happening out of his hand. That's the idea that seems to be hinted at. But there's also something really special about these action words that Mark uses. Take, bless, broke, gave, that we're going to look at at the end. But it, there's something special there. The point is, Mark wants us to see that this is more about the miracle worker than the miracle itself. This isn't just about the fact that up to 10,000 people got fed supernaturally. It's not just about that. It's about who provided that. It's about who did that work. Because if we ever forget that it's the Lord who does the work, guess what's going to stop happening? The work. It's the Lord who does the work. It's the Lord who builds this house. It's the Lord who builds this church. It's the Lord who gives the increase. It's he who does the work by his Holy Spirit. All we can say is, Lord, we're desperate for what you want to do. And so we want to find our rest in you, and we want to be as organized as we can be, and we want to admit our limitations, and we want to say, Lord, would you do it? Each and every Sunday and Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday night, and every time we gather together around every dinner table with our family, Lord, we're saying, would you do it? Would you do it? You can keep us from murdering our children. You can keep us from giving up on our teenagers. You can give us what we need. Lord, you can handle our grief. And you can give us the ability to handle others' grief. Lord, you can do this. You can grant us repentance, Lord. You can do this. Only you can do this. Mark wants us to see it's the miracle worker, not the miracle that we need to recognize. So what happens? Verse 42, we're almost done. In verse 42, it says, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Now, now here's, here's the reality, okay? The crowds knew they had a satisfying meal. That's, that's obvious in the text, right? And, and the disciples must have known, okay, that God had just provided for them. They're going to have plenty to eat. They have this basket full of food because, again, they're probably as hungry as the rest of the crowd. That's what they know. But what's missing here tells us maybe what they didn't seem to know. Because when you see Jesus doing miracles in other places, you see people blown away and going, this guy must be the Messiah. And we will, you will see if you read uh, John chapter 6, that they were, they were definitely thinking this. They definitely saw a connection between the supernatural miracle and death. But Mark seems to kind of keep that out for some reason. And you see, when, when Jesus did a miracle uh, with, with the disciples, like when he walks on water, which happens just after this, th- they're like just scared to death. And he says, did, you know, why are you such a little faith? You saw what I just did. 
Like they, they just seem to kind of get it. Or when they does walk on the water and he comes in the boat, they go, wow, who is this? That the wind and waves are calmed by one word by this guy. They, they worship, basically. And here we don't see that kind of thanksgiving and worship so much. And it's like Mark wants to show us that, listen, that the thing that they, they didn't seem to realize was that Jesus was revealing who he is. Mark's gospel starts this way. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That the reason Jesus is doing this miracle is to show them exactly who he is. And they seem to get the miracle, but not the miracle worker. They seem to not realize this is who he is. 